From New York, this is Democracy Now! This is not the time for complacency. While we continue to receive encouraging news about COVID-19 vaccines, we are extremely concerned by the surging cases we are seeing in some countries, particularly in Europe and the Americas. As the U.S. COVID-19 death toll nears a quarter of a million, a second major drug maker reports encouraging findings for a COVID vaccine. We'll speak to Dr. Saad Omer, the director of the Yale Institute for Global Health. Then, nine months into the pandemic, we look at how many hospitals are failing to provide adequate PPE to doctors and nurses. We'll talk to Jean Ross, co-president of National Nurses United. We have been calling for this protection for healthcare workers, not just for many months now, but also, if you recall, since the Ebola crisis hit our shores. And sad to say, we are still very lacking. Plus, Central America has been devastated by back-to-back climate change-fueled hurricanes over the past two weeks. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The United States recorded nearly 167,000 new coronavirus cases on Monday, the third highest daily toll of the pandemic. The official U.S. death toll, already the highest in the world, is rapidly approaching a quarter of a million, with 800 coronavirus deaths over the past 24 hours. In California, Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom ordered stringent pandemic restrictions for three-quarters of California's counties and is considering a statewide curfew across the state. Iowa's Republican Governor Kim Reynolds has ordered a statewide indoor mask mandate, with some exceptions, along with limits on bars and restaurants and a ban on certain public gatherings. In Arizona, the Navajo Nation Monday ordered non-essential businesses closed, canceled in-person classes and shut roads to visitors, warning of uncontrolled spread of the virus. In South Dakota, where the COVID-19 death rate is among the worst in the world, emergency room nurse Jody Doring says she's treated many patients who deny COVID-19. COVID-19 is making them ill, even as they're hospitalized. In a now viral thread on Twitter, Doring wrote, quote, these people really think this isn't going to happen to them, and then they stop yelling at you when they get intubated. She spoke on CNN. Their last dying words are, um, this can't be happening, it's not real. And when they should be spending time FaceTiming their families, they're filled with anger and hatred, and it just made me really sad the other night. And um, I just can't believe that those are going to be their last thoughts and words. In Delaware, President-elect Joe Biden spoke of a very dark winter ahead, as the U.S. continues to lead the world in coronavirus infections and deaths. Biden was asked what will happen if President Trump continues to prevent Biden's transition team from coordinating with the outgoing administration. More people may die if we don't coordinate. Biden called on Senate Republicans to pass a COVID relief package like the $3 trillion HEROES Act approved by House Democrats last May. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris noted the pandemic has a far greater impact on communities of color. Black Americans and Latinos are three times as likely to contract COVID as others and more likely to die. Native Americans are more than four times as likely to be hospitalized as others. And last month, the unemployment rate for black Americans was almost twice the rate of others. Michigan's Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer is blasting White House coronavirus adviser Doc Scott, Dr. Scott Atlas after he called on Michiganders to rise up against public health measures aimed at slowing the spread of COVID-19. On Sunday, Atlas tweeted, quote, "'The only way this stops is if people rise up. You get what you accept,' he tweeted." Atlas's tweet came just over a month after the FBI said it had broken up a plot by at least 14 men to attack the Michigan state capitol and to kidnap Governor Whitmer. Whitmer later said Atlas's tweet, quote, took my breath away. She spoke with CNN Sunday evening. 
We know that the White House likes to single us out here in Michigan, me out in particular. I'm not going to be bullied into not following reputable scientists and medical professionals. On Monday, Stanford University issued a statement disting itself from radiologist Dr. Scott Atlas, who's currently on leave as a senior fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution. The statement read, quote, Dr. Atlas has expressed views that are inconsistent with the university's approach and response to the pandemic in Mexico. Confirmed coronavirus cases have topped 1 million, though the true number of infections is likely many times higher. Mexico's official COVID-19 death toll is nearing 100,000. Pakistan has banned public rallies after a spike in COVID-19 cases. Russia turned an ice rink into a temporary hospital as its cases reached a daily record of nearly 23,000 new infections. Iran also reported its largest daily increase with over 13,000 confirmed cases. Hurricane Iota made landfall on Monday afternoon on Nicaragua's Caribbean coast, an extremely dangerous Category 4 storm. Much of the city of Puerto Cabezas has been left without power, with the roofs of homes and a makeshift hospital ripped off by heavy winds and rain. Iota is the strongest hurricane ever observed this late in the season. It hit Central America just days after Hurricane Eta devastated communities across the region, killing at least 150 people and leaving tens of thousands homeless. We'll have the latest on the Central American hurricanes fueled by the climate crisis later in the broadcast. President Trump continues to refuse to concede to President-elect Joe Biden. On Monday, Trump tweeted, Ohio's next Republican gubernatorial primary would be hotly contested after Republican Governor Mike DeWine publicly acknowledged Biden's victory. On Monday, Trump's campaign gave up major parts of its federal lawsuit challenging election results in Pennsylvania, a state Biden won by over 73,000 votes. Trump supporters also dropped lawsuits challenging results in Michigan, Georgia, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Georgia's Republican Secretary of State says members of his own party are pressuring him to exclude legally cast ballots from a hand recount of November 3rd's election results. Speaking from quarantine after his wife tested positive for COVID, Brad Raffensperger said South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, urged him to throw out all mail-in ballots in certain counties. And Raffensperger blasted Georgia Republican Congressmember Doug Collins for accusing him of capitulating to Democrats. Raffensperger said, quote, I'm an engineer. We look at numbers. We look at hard data. I can't help it that a failed candidate like Doug Collins is running around lying to everyone. He's a liar, he said. Georgia's secretary of state said. Georgia's initial count showed Joe Biden won by over 14,000 votes, a result that's extremely unlikely to change significantly after a recount. The New York Times reports President Trump has inquired about bombing Iran's main nuclear site in the coming weeks. Trump raised the issue during a meeting Thursday with Vice President Mike Pence, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and top military officials, including Christopher Miller, the new acting defense secretary. The Times reports the advisers attempted to dissuade the president, warning that a strike could escalate into a broader conflict. But officials told The Times Trump may still be looking for ways to attack Iran or Iranian assets before his term ends. Thursday's meeting was held a day after international inspectors reported Iran's low, enriched uranium stockpile is growing again, following Trump's abandonment of the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Iran is enriching the uranium at a level suitable for nuclear power plants, but not nuclear weapons. The New York Times is also reporting Trump's expected to soon order the withdrawal of thousands of troops from Afghanistan, Iraq and Somalia. The proposed plan would leave about 2,000 troops in Afghanistan and 2,500 in Iraq. The withdrawal has been opposed by some top military officials. Shortly before he was fired, former Defense Secretary Mark Esper sent a classified memo to the White House opposing the troop withdrawal from Afghanistan. 
The Ethiopian Air Force bombed the capital of the semi-autonomous northern state of Tigray Monday as part of a new offensive in the nearly two-week conflict. This comes as the Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who won the Nobel Peace Prize last year, is rejecting calls to de-escalate. Hundreds of people have died since Ethiopian troops began the attack on Tigray on November 4th. More than 25,000 refugees have fled into Sudan. Peru's Congress on Monday selected the country's third leader in just the past week. Francisco Sagastia's rise to power came a day after the interim president, Manuel Marino, resigned amidst ongoing mass protests in which at least two people were killed. Marino was appointed after what opponents are calling a legislative coup against former president Martín Vizcarra, who was impeached and removed as he's being investigated for corruption allegations. At least half of Peru's Congress members are also under investigation for corruption. In Brazil, local election results in the country's main cities show candidates backed by far-right President Jair Bolsonaro have lost across the board. Among the victories is the election of Monica Benizio of the Rio de Janeiro City Council. Benizio is the widow of Marielle Franco, a vocal black LGBTQ rights activist, longtime critic of police brutality. While in office, Franco was the only black woman in Rio City Council. She was assassinated in 2018. Her murder remains unsolved. Back in the United States, nearly 93,000 claims of sexual abuse have been filed against the Boy Scouts of America. Monday was the deadline for victims to submit claims against the now bankrupt organization. Andrew Van Arsdale, a lawyer with the group abused in scouting, said sexual abuse was a, quote, unspoken norm within the Scouts. The New York Times reports most serious misconduct charges against New York City police officers were met with lenient punishments as the department constantly ignored or downplayed the need for stricter response. Of nearly 7,000 misconduct charges against officers, the department overruled harsher punishments in about 70 percent of cases, including officers accused of physically assaulting people. Meanwhile, New York City simultaneously paid millions of dollars to settle lawsuits that stem from those same abuse complaints. This comes as New York City added another 900 cops to police force last month. Over the weekend, dozens of people in New York City took to the streets protesting ongoing police killings and abuse. This is Robert Cuffey, an organizer with Democratic Socialists of America. At the end of the day, the police cannot fulfill the main demand of our movement, which is to stop killing black people. Since this movement has launched, like they killed David McAtee in Kentucky, they killed Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta. So they'll, they're going to be more and more flashpoints, but there's a sustained movement because of the daily presence of these people in our lives. Last week, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio launched a pilot program that would remove police officers from responding to mental health calls. And those are some of the stories. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As coronavirus cases soar across the country and around the globe, the drug maker Moderna announced Monday its coronavirus vaccine is nearly 95 percent effective. This comes after pharmaceutical giant Pfizer announced a vaccine last week with 90 percent effectiveness. As the virus has now killed at least 1.2 million people nationwide worldwide, the companies say they could offer 20 million doses of the vaccine to people in the United States by some time next month. But officials warn the widespread distribution of a vaccine for coronavirus will be a tremendously difficult and lengthy task. The World Health Organization's immunization director, Catherine O'Brien, said Monday that discovering a vaccine was, quote, like building a base camp on Mount Everest. This comes as the United States recorded nearly 167,000 new cases on Monday, the third highest daily toll of the pandemic. Nearly 800 people died of COVID-19 on Monday, bringing the official U.S. toll to nearly 247,000. For more on the latest vaccine news, we're joined from New Haven, Connecticut, by Dr. Saad Omer. He is director of the Yale Institute for Global Health, professor of infectious diseases at Yale School of Medicine, and a vaccine researcher. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. So let's talk about some numbers. You had this amazing announcement last week by Pfizer-BioNTech that their vaccine is 90 percent effective. That's followed this week by Moderna's 
uh, vaccine. Moderna is saying the vaccine is 94.5 percent effective. These are astounding figures. But then I want to talk about two. That's how we got this information, by two press releases, one from Moderna and one from Pfizer. So, Dr. Saad Omer, this is unusual, the way this vaccine information is coming out. These are not peer-reviewed. They were, are released by corporations. As soon as they are released, uh, their stocks skyrocket. How can we trust this? What should we understand? What do you understand? So, the news that is out there is reassuring, but you're right. We need a little bit more information, and we need a little bit more transparency. Um, I can understand that they have they want to get the information out right away due to insider trading concerns and whatever. But soon after that, there should be a little bit more detail, and it should be in the uh, in, in the form of some scientific report, um, ideally of a preprint, if not a full peer-reviewed report, um, and so on and so forth. Even if it's preliminary data, um, I think a little bit more could be released rather than uh, a pre press release. So what kind of encouragement are you taking from this? How significant? And what about these two tests, um, um, these remarkable findings? And what does it mean for further testing? Uh, who has to approve this next? How fast these become available, even as other uh, vaccines, we understand AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, are nearing announcement as well? So this is certainly good news. And uh, I don't think there's much of a, a practical difference between a 90 percent efficacy uh, or 95 percent efficacy in preliminary results. Uh, so that's one thing. The, the, the best news is that for the first time, it has been shown that there can be a vaccine against this uh, coronavirus, against SARS-CoV-2. So just the establishment of that proof of principle that uh, an effective vaccine can be created by any method is, is a big deal. The second thing is that the spike protein, which is targeted by both of these vaccines, um, is which is the target. We have put uh, most, if not all, actually not all, but most of our eggs in the basket of targeting the spike protein. Um, that's reassuring that two vaccines targeting that um, are, seem to be working. The third thing is that the mRNA technology, both of them, seem to be working. So, so these are good um, news. This is part of good news. There's a lots to be known. For example, we need to know how long it's going to work. Uh, we need a little bit more detailed safety data. And, and the way it is likely to be approved is it's likely to be or authorized. It's, it's likely to go to the FDA now. So both the companies have indicated uh, they're going to go to the FDA in the, within the next few weeks. Uh, and, and FDA has had a little bit of a course correction in the past four or five weeks where they have been more um, open about following the mainstream process. Um, and, you know, frankly, due to the pushback from the career folks there. Um, but, uh, but that is reassuring. And, and the, it's likely that then these vaccines will be, the data from these vaccines, even more detailed data, will be presented to the advisory committee, the independent advisory committee of the FDA and FDA itself. And then um, a decision will be made. So talk about what's needed for distribution. We understand that um, the Pfizer-BioNTech double vaccine, you need two of them, um, has to be kept at sub-zero temperatures. Many states are deeply concerned in the United States, not to mention countries around the world, and you're deeply involved with both, as you're involved with the World Health Organization, um, do not have the special freezers that are needed. Moderna is different, though it still needs freezers. Yeah, so uh, we call that ultra-cold chain requirement for uh, something like um, what would be required for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And uh, that is a problem. Uh, that is a, actually, I would say it, was, it is a challenge. It's not unsurmountable uh, because the Ebola vaccine was distributed uh, in a low-income country situation uh, using ultra cold chain, so it's not impossible, but it's a it's a pretty substantial challenge, and uh, WHO has been focusing on this in anticipation in terms of country preparedness. But look, preparing the you know the world is not easy, 
Similarly, in the U.S., um, I wish we had been planning a little bit. We, we had started planning a little bit earlier, but the CDC has um, uh, released a few documents, has been working with several states to get us online as a country uh, to prepare for uh, vaccines that require ultra-cold chain. But that doesn't mean that it's not going to pose challenges. It's going to pose substantial challenges, especially my concern is in terms of equity. Um, so people who have access to facilities, um, uh, both physical and otherwise, uh, that have uh, these kinds of requirements, um, have you know are different from people who don't have access to these facilities, um, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, it is not unsurmountable, but we we need to work hard towards it. And talk about what this means for who has access and who doesn't, both in the United States but also around the world. You're involved with the World Health Organization. Uh, can you talk about how these vaccines will be distributed? Already, the most wealthy countries in the world, haven't they bought up the vast majority of that, these vaccines in advance, ordered them? Yes and no. So, so there are two mechanisms. So individual countries are doing their own deals, uh, et cetera, those who can afford it with these vaccine companies. But then there's this mechanism called COVAX facility, which has like two subgroups. One is that you can buy anyone, any rich or poor country can buy into that uh, facility and say, look, you are backing um, nine vaccines, uh, for example, you, you're backing a set of vaccines. And whichever is successful, we don't know if, uh, for example, Brazil or South Africa makes a bet, uh, if you will, on one vaccine if it, and it doesn't work. Then, then they are in trouble. So they pool that risk through that part. But then there's another component of it which says that countries can, that do not afford, uh, that cannot afford um, uh, th th this vaccine can either, you know, do it through their resources uh, or a combination of their own resources and aid and, and a World Bank loan, et cetera. So the idea is that this facility can uh, make this vaccine available uh, to the world, uh, to a lot of countries of the world. But even at that, uh, you know, it's not too ambitious. It says that uh, at least in the initial phase, it will focus on 20 percent of uh, supply for each country. Um, and so that um, is a, a group that is making efforts towards it. Unfortunately, the U.S. has been conspicuous by its absence uh, in terms of backing that um, COVAX facility. Um, and so hopefully that will change. Hopefully, there will be a focus on, on the fact that, um, you know, it is in our interest uh, to, to make sure that everyone uh, is disease-free with this virus, because it is a pandemic. It impacts everyone. But beyond this, um, you know, uh, this, this enlightened self-interest, uh, we should be—the U.S. has been a leader in global health, um, played a substantial role in smallpox eradication, for example— um, and uh, played a substantial role in uh, in the efforts, the ongoing efforts uh, for polio eradication. Uh, so it is it is pretty surprising and, and, and disheartening that the U.S. is absent from uh, COVAX and COVAX facility. So again, talking about um, not just because people think it's fair that everyone in the world should get this vaccine, but the self-interest. I'm looking at a piece in Medical Express that says, researchers found the rich nation stockpiling scenario reduced COVID-19 deaths by 33 percent globally. The fair share approach prevented 61 percent. And as we know, this is a highly infectious disease. If one part of the world is infected, we are all threatened. Exactly. No, it, it's smart disease control strategy that we don't go alone. It's, it's, it's understandable for every country to make sure that its own population is protected, but that is not a zero-sum game. Uh, that also means that we don't have to just look inwards. Uh, we are, again, we have been leaders in global health, um, and, and we have to, uh, you know, uh, do our part in making sure that the rest of the world also gets this vaccine. So, uh, Dr. Sadomar, you're at Yale. Uh, several of your colleagues are on the Biden coronavirus task force. Um, President Trump has refused to cooperate in the standard transition from one president to another. This is not just a 
point of politeness. This is a point of what happens in a case like this, um, where you had President Trump once saying he considered himself a war president taking on coronavirus. Of course, since then, he said um, it's like a small flu and is not been to a coronavirus task force, I think, in something like five months. But what does it mean that this task force, that um, Vice President-elect uh, Kamala Harris and President-elect Biden have put together, cannot get information from the Trump administration in terms of moving forward to um, vaccinate, if possible, much of the population of the United States? That's unfortunate. Um, because there are things that need to be coordinated with the federal agencies. Um, or my hope is that um, you know agencies like the CDC and FDA and BARDA, uh, a somewhat obscure agency within the Health and Human Services that was created in early 2000s with bipartisan support to develop these kinds of countermeasures and vaccines, et cetera, and actually, by the way, played a huge role and or a substantial role uh, not as much as I, as I would have liked, but still a significant role in um, in this pandemic as well. So these kinds of agencies need to be on board with the response um, going forward, um, and not just on board. Uh, they need to enhance their response, and there needs to be coordination um, sort of at the federal level. All of that would require a smooth handover, um, access to career professionals, um, and so on and so forth. So it is unfortunate. It doesn't mean uh, that uh, the, the incoming administration cannot do the, its homework entirely. Um, a lot of engagement can happen with states uh, and other entities, uh, scientific entities, um, uh, professional medical associations, et cetera. But uh, they, need, they should have access uh, to, to the federal system. I wanted to ask about patents. In this time of this massive threat to human life around the world, with the developed world expecting to get the vast majority of the vaccines as they become available, um, I'm looking at The Wall Street Journal, which says if the developed nations don't relent, South Africa is prepared to try to force the issue through a rare contested vote at the World Trade Organization. Um, uh, which would challenge patents of these large pharmaceutical manufacturers? Look, I think there are already mechanisms to devolve uh, sort of under license uh, some production around the world. And that has to happen. Uh, the world's biggest producers by volume are, are not in the Western world. Uh, the biggest producers are, for example, in India and China. And so it would be a tragedy if uh, intellectual property becomes a bottleneck. I think what is reassuring on that side that they, I have heard some noise about um, sort of under license allowing um, some of the manufacturers, um, uh, you know, in India and China, and spe specifically India, uh, to, to scale up production. Um, and, and India supplies a, a, a lot of the vaccine that is used in the low, in low income countries well beyond India it, itself. So I hope that happens. I hope we do not um, not just uh, have barriers uh, due to intellectual property, but um, we don't delay the program. Um, you know, a, a delayed vaccination program uh, inherently is uh, an inequitable program because um, you know it, it exposes the most vulnerable um, to to the, these kinds of diseases and um, and infections more than those who are more privileged. Finally, um, your quick response on why the coronavirus is increasing exponentially in the richest country in the world, right here in the United States. Unfortunately, it's all about implementation and leadership. Um, and this is not a you know, political statement. It's, it's at various levels of the government um, that this, this has happened. Um, so that's part of it. But on top of it is the is the idea that, you know, when the pandemic started, the respiratory virus season in the U.S. was waning. Uh, and so we never saw the, the optimal time during which these kinds of viruses, not just coronaviruses, transmit most efficiently. And 
there are different factors. Um, the role of each of these factors is unclear for other respiratory viruses as well. Uh, but, but it is postulated, and it is actually known it's a combination of these factors, including crowding indoors, uh, including uh, humidity and temperature, et cetera, that facilitates transmission. And so now we are entering that season with a suboptimal baseline, and, and we are seeing these record numbers. So and the it is highly of, important. the effect of Dr. Atlas, a top coronavirus advisor, telling people to rise up against health regulations, what this means— yeah, no, it, it is. I think we should all be following it. And it's not that hard. Uh, as we have known, as the evidence evolved, as we have known uh, about masks uh, and their utility um, in, in preventing this outbreak, the evidence emerged, evolved. Um, it's out there. Uh, you can have a difference of opinion about tactics, but, but the big strategy things like testing, like um, social distancing, and, and nobody at this point is advocating uh, outright lockdowns. Uh, people are advocating for more fine-tuned approaches. I think, and then it really surprises me that even with this kind of an approach, there's this reaction, um, you know, even, even something like a mask that doesn't Im impose uh, on people's freedoms, et cetera, People uh, are making these kinds of unfounded statements. Dr. Saad Omar, we want to thank you very much for being with us, director of the Yale Institute for Global Health, professor of infectious diseases at Yale School of Medicine. When we come back, we talk to the president of the National Nurses United about how, nine months into the pandemic, many hospitals are failing to provide adequate PPE to doctors and nurses and so much more. Back in 30 seconds. Working Poor by Fantastic Negrito. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As the COVID-19 pandemic enters its ninth month, a new report by National Nurses United, the largest nurses' union in the United States, finds hospitals are still failing to provide adequate PPE, protective, personal protective equipment, and are unprepared as the surge is expected to get far worse during the flu season. Nurses also report mental health struggles related to the pandemic. National Nurses United estimates at least 2,000 frontline health care workers have died due to COVID-19. The number could be far higher. Nurses of color account for half of those deaths, even though they're less than a quarter of the workforce. This comes as North Dakota's Republican Governor Doug Burgum has called on infected but asymptomatic health workers to keep treating COVID patients. Meanwhile, in Texas, a state appeals court has blocked El Paso County's shutdown of non-essential businesses that had been implemented to slow a massive outbreak after it was challenged by Texas Attorney General. After the ruling Friday, National Nurses United held a virtual news conference with a group of registered nurses in El Paso who spoke out against the ruling. This is Idali Cooper. Really, um, in a community that is really, um, we are the majority as Hispanic people. And we have been affected the most. It is imperative to um, inform our governor or attorney general that their, their decisions have dire consequences for my community or for, for communities of color. I'm just extremely exhausted emotionally, physically. I haven't recovered. I have to go back to work tomorrow. I have not recovered I feel I've been napping all week and um, knowing that my patients are being intubated, um, it's very demoralizing. And I just want the community to know that it's very important for all of us, even though our governor and attorney general did, did not do the right decision for our community, that we do what's right for our community, regardless of what they say. Um, Right now, um, in the adult units, there's not enough nurses for all the patients that are being, being take, that need to be taken care of adequately. 
That's registered nurse Dolly Cooper speaking in El Paso Friday, where prisoners are being paid $2 an hour to move the bodies of people who've died of COVID-19 to mobile morgues, as the number of cases and deaths has completely overwhelmed local hospitals. For more, we're joined by Jean Ross, acute care registered nurse, president of National Nurses United. She's in Bloomington, Minnesota. We welcome you back to Democracy Now!, Jean. Um, talk about what nurses are facing around the country right now, what your report found. What we found was, if we compare this report um, as of October, November, to when we first started at the beginning of the pandemic, things have not gotten better, and in many cases, they've gotten worse. Um, nurses still are not getting the PPE that we need. Uh, many hospitals are still not cohorting, putting COVID-19 patients separate from other patients. Uh, hospitals still don't have a plan in place for a surge, and we're currently in a surge. And nurses are reporting feeling more devastated, more sleepless, um, not hopeless. We keep our spirits up. But we do need to see some sort of improvement from our employers, from our government, that we're not seeing right now. Can you talk about what the federal government needs to do right now? When you say hospitals aren't providing the PPE, how are they supposed to get them? How is it possible that nine months into this pandemic, um, that there are still not enough tests available, there are still not enough masks available and other protective gear all over the country? What are you demanding of the Trump administration? Well, two main things would really help. One is to fully fully institute the DPA, the Defense Production Act, that, uh, that act that came with wartime where you can have manufacturing in this country gear up so that we have the amount of PPE that we need. The other would be a temporary emergency OSHA standard that says for infectious diseases for this period of time, hospitals, these employers must give at least this minimum standard of PPE and make sure that there's enough of it. So right now, we're being told different things by the employers. Sometimes they say, yes, we have plenty, but we have to keep them under lock and key in case there's a surge. Well, there is a surge, and they're still insisting that many, if not most, nurses reuse equipment that really is supposed to be single use. Can you talk about the mental health of nurses across the country? I mean, the devastating fact that nine months in, we're now talking about some of the worst figures of the entire pandemic for deaths and infections. How do healthcare workers keep going? Well, basically, it's it's our job. I mean, that that that's what you're prepared to do. But until this pandemic, and I would say not the pandemic— because we always knew this was at some point inevitable. But it's the lack of response, the improper response, that has nurses and other healthcare workers really down. Most of our nurses uh, report, even in their downtime that they get now, there's, they're not sleeping as well. Um, they're, they're anxious. They didn't used to be so anxious. And they're anxious about not just passing it on to other people, um, to their families, to other patients, but the fact that they might not be able to keep going, because it is very devastating to see this amount of death every day, every shift, with what appears to be no end in sight. So let me ask you about North Dakota Republican Governor Doug Burgum, uh, who said that infected nurses and health care workers should still continue working if they're asymptomatic. Yeah, that statement is just unconscionable. It's so irresponsible. I understand where he gets it from, though. Um, every that, as in many other things, um, they look to the CDC. And unfortunately, with requests from the hospital association employers and others, they have continued to downgrade their guidelines and their recommendations. But this novel virus, we know one of the things that's unique about it is that you can be completely asymptomatic and yet be a spreader, a very effective spreader. What sense does it make 
for a nurse to go into the hospital and try to take care of people who are ill, albeit with the same disease, doesn't matter, and spread it to others, including her family. So it's it's just it's irresponsible and it's it's something I never thought I would hear and from the government. Let me ask so. you about another study that you've put out that revealed hospitals may be charging as much as eighteen times over their costs. Your response? Yes, uh, again, unconscionable, but that seems to be the way in this country, up to eighteen times. So, for example, if you're uh, true cost, it's called the charge to cost ratio or CCR. If your true cost for your uh, service is $100, they are in many cases charging up to $1,800. And they do it because they can. And I want to go to South Dakota, where the COVID-19 death rate is among the worst in the world. Uh, Governor Kristi Noem, a close Trump ally, has said she would not enforce a mask mandate, even if ordered by future President Joe Biden. South Dakota ER nurse Jody During says some of her COVID-19 patients refuse to believe that COVID is real her COVID patients. And a now viral thread on Twitter, she wrote, these people really think this isn't going to happen to them. Then they stop yelling at you when they get intubated. This is during speaking on CNN. Their last dying words are, um, this can't be happening. It's not real. And when they should be spending time FaceTiming their families, they're filled with anger and hatred, and it just made me really sad the other night. And um, I just can't believe that those are going to be their last thoughts and words. I mean, this is astounding. They are fighting with the nursing staff, saying, why are you wearing the, that protective gear? Uh, what I am dying of is not COVID-19, and they only stop yelling um, when they're intubated. Uh, that's South Dakota. We had a story out of Provo, Utah, also so hard hit, where people were trying to break into the local hospital, packed to the gills with COVID patients, saying they don't believe that people are in there in ICUs with COVID. Yeah, I, I did hear um, that Jody say that, and I feel so bad for her and for other nurses. This, these are things we didn't used to have to contend with, but that's what happens with when people are brainwashed. And what you hope for when you know your patient is probably going to die is the most peaceful death possible in their situation. That isn't peaceful, and, and that's got to be devastating scary for that patient and devastating for the nurse and the family. Final question, and we only have a few seconds. What are you demanding right now? As president of National Nurses United, um, the Biden transition is happening, whether or not Trump uh, is helping with it. Uh, what do you demand happens? Because Trump is still there for two months. That is tens of thousands of people dying in this country. Well, what we're asking is that uh, President-elect Biden and Kamala Harris continue the good fight to try to get into that transitioning. We know they're doing all the right things right now, putting together the proper people. For once, some sane, rational people who believe in science, the true experts, and listening to them. This is a step in the right direction. Um, and continue to put those people in place so that we push again for the PPE, the Defense Production Act, that OSHA standard. Uh, it can't come soon enough. Jean Ross, I want to thank you for being with us, president of National Nurses United. When we come back, we look at Central America devastated by back-to-back -back climate change-fueled hurricanes just over the last few weeks. Stay with us. by Sara Kuducic. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman.
as we turn to Central America. On Monday, Hurricane Iota made landfall on Nicaragua's Caribbean coast as a Category 4 storm just two weeks after Hurricane Eta devastated communities across the region, killing at least 140 people, leaving hundreds of thousands homeless. Hurricane Iota is the strongest November hurricane to ever make landfall in Nicaragua. It left much of the coastal city of Puerto Cabezas without power. Dozens of indigenous communities in Nicaragua and Honduras were evacuated this weekend. This is a resident of Puerto Cabezas who sought shelter ahead of the storm. It was on course to the town and we could die. That's why we have to come here to shelter. I'm now sad because over there, in the Cape, there is nothing to eat at all. All the plantations have come down. Hurricane Iota's devastation comes as much of the Central American region is still reeling from the destruction of Hurricane Eta, which impacted more than three million people, displaced hundreds of thousands of people in Guatemala alone. The back-to-back -back climate change fueled hurricanes come amidst the raging coronavirus pandemic. For more, we're joined by Giovanni Batz, who's been in touch with people reeling from the hurricanes in Guatemala and has been helping coordinate aid distribution, one of the indigenous communities impacted by the storm. He's a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. His forthcoming book, tentatively titled The Fourth Invasion, Decolonial Histories, Megaprojects, and Ishil Maya Resistance in Guatemala. He's joining us from Las Cruces, New Mexico. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us, Giovanni. Describe what is happening right now. Hi. Well, first, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, uh, in terms of what's going on in Central America, um, unfortunately, the news isn't uh, great. Obviously, with the hurricanes, it's caused a lot of damages to, obviously, the most vulnerable populations, which tends to be indigenous peoples, uh, Afro-descendants, uh, and black communities all across Central America. Uh, so right now, um, as a result of the hur Hurricane Eta, uh, there's been communities that have been um, um, in, severely impacted. Uh, there's been communities that uh, have experienced mudslides. Roads have been destroyed. Bridges have been destroyed. Uh, some communities don't have access um, to the town centers where they can uh, access uh, uh, health care uh, or their necessities. So right now, uh, unfortunately, the reality is grim. Um, on top of that, with, with the pandemic, the government hasn't been responding uh, ad adequately enough, uh, so enough aid isn't being provided to people. Uh, so the situation is extremely concerning, especially now with Yoda, um, you know, hitting Central America now. So talk about how climate change is connected to this mass devastation. Sure. Yeah. So uh, indigenous communities have been warning us that climate change is a real thing, right? And unfortunately, they tend to be uh, uh, indigenous communities tend to be heavily impacted by this. Um, so as a result of deforestation, as a result of, of, of um, increasing droughts, people are finding um, uh, the conditions a, a lot more severe, right? Um, so in the, where I work in the Ishil region, a lot of people have argued that, um, that climate change has really um, uh, devastated their communities. So the rains are a little bit heavier. Um, this is causing uh, more mudslides. Uh, among other things. So, um, you know, the, uh, um, it's not just necessarily just climate change as well. It's also the arrival of extractivist industries like hydroelectric plants uh, and dams and mining, which is actually uh, cr making a, a situation a lot more worse. Uh, so I work in a place called the Ishil region. The Ishil region was heavily impacted during the Guatemalan Civil War between 1960 and 1996. Um, they experienced 114 massacres. Um, and here in the Ishil region, they're experiencing the arrival of mega projects, which they refer to as the new invasion. Uh, and one of the reasons why they call it the new invasion is because these are foreign-owned, imposed uh, 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 extractivist industry projects um, that, again, create environmental degradation. Um, so right now, one of the things that we're looking at is that governments will propose uh, hydroelectric projects to reduce CO2. Uh, they'll propose... Uh, uh, hydroelectric plants and dams as a form of green energy. Uh, but when you look at the local situations, these dams, these mega projects are actually causing a lot of environmental uh, damage. So the hydroelectric plant that I look at in my work and in, in that forthcoming book is the Palo Viejo hydroelectric plant, um, and it, which was constructed by an Italian corporation by the name of Enel Green Power. Now, Enel Green Power will say that this plant is reducing CO2, 
producing green energy and combating climate change. But when you look at the local realities, um, they've actually diverted the rivers uh, through the construction of four diversion dams. Uh, they flooded um, uh, one of the rivers. They've actually contaminated the rivers to the point where after the, the river passes this through this hydroelectric plant, um, the river has been visibly contaminated. Uh, the fish have, have died off. Uh, children who bathe in the river um, come out with rashes, warts, among other things. Uh, uh, these hydroelectric plants, for instance, um, are viewed as a solution for climate change, uh, but indigenous communities will tell you that they're actually causing social division, further militarization, and environmental degradation. So when we think about climate change, we also have to take into consideration these exact extractivist industries and how they're only um, further exasperating an already dire situation. Let's go to Guatemalan President Alejandro Giamate speaking Monday about the impact of climate change and the powerful storms on Guatemala's economy. Every time there is a natural disaster as a result of climate change, we acquire debt. And we have come out to knock on the doors of the generous banks and multilateral organizations that give us higher financing to achieve a reconstruction. This has brought a vicious cycle where we get into debt, we reconstruct, it gets destroyed, we get into debt, we rebuild, and it gets destroyed again. So that's the Guatemalan president. Guatemala um, uh, Guatemala is also asking, uh, petitioning the Trump administration for temporary protective status, that's TPS for Guatemalans in the U.S., due to the destruction of ETA. Um, can you talk about your thoughts on this? I mean, years ago, after Hurricane Mitch, Hondurans as well as Nicaraguans got TPS as a result of the devastation. Yeah, absolutely. Any sort of protections for migrants is, is definitely welcome. TPS obviously isn't perfect in the sense that there needs to be a pathway to citizenship. Um, it tends to be a very ambiguous uh, situation where people, um, you know, live uncertain lives. I mean, Trump is trying to get rid of TPS, and that places people who did receive TPS, uh, Salvadorans and Nicaraguans, among others, uh, in a very precarious situation. So uh, any legal protections for migrants is definitely welcome. Uh, but the U.S. needs to stop deporting people, first and foremost. Um, just in the first two weeks of November, for instance, after at the hit, uh, the U.S. continues to deport folks. Uh, there are 742 people who were deported uh, between November 1st and November uh, uh, 12th. 208 of those were unaccompanied minors, or in other words, 28 percent of those being deported. Uh, so while TPS is yeah, it would be it would be great. It needs to be perfected in the sense of, of allowing folks to gain legal citizenship. Um, we also have to help asylum seekers um, uh, at the U.S.-Mexico border. Guatemala itself uh, is morally bankrupt in the sense that, you know, th th there's a reason why people flee Guatemala, right? Uh, it has to do with structural violence, uh, community leaders who are being persecuted uh, for their activism against mega projects, among other things. So Guatemala um, also has to improve um, uh, the situation in, in Guatemala, because there's a reason why people are fleeing. The Trump administration has virtually ended asylum. And when you talk about people being deported, so a number of them have COVID-19. Um, but also the criminalization of climate refugees, Giovanni. Yeah, absolutely. Again, when we think about climate refugees, um, you know, today in Guatemala, there's a lot of people who are being displaced as a result of these natural disasters. Uh, but unfortunately, indigenous communities uh, and those who rise up to um, engage in social justice movement, fight for environmental justice, um, these are the people who are, are being persecuted. Uh, so in my work, I also analyze uh, uh, community leaders who are, are being persecuted, by, again, by, by the states, by corporation, among other uh, by other um, uh, sources. Uh, I'll provide one example. There's two friends here in Ciudad Juarez, less than an hour away from where I'm currently located in Las Cruces, Francis Francisco Chavez and uh, Gaspar Cobo Corillo. Uh, they were two activists from the Ishu region of Neva uh, who were forced out of their communities due to their activism. So for, for, so for instance, Gaspar, who's an anti-mining activist and, and protested against mega projects, uh, received death threats, right? So now he found himself, now him and Francisco, who was a witness against uh, Rios Mont, during the genocide trial a couple of years ago, um, have, have sought refuge in Ciudad Juarez. They've been there over a year as a result of Trump's uh, stay in Mexico policy. Uh, so living in Ciudad Juarez isn't the best uh, scenario for them. Um, they uh, Migrants there tend to receive death threats. They're vulnerable uh, to, to, to a lot of um, uh, criminal activity. So unfortunately, the Trump administration is responsible for the deaths and the suffering for a lot of migrants 
um, here in, 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 the, in the U.S.-Mexico border. Giovanni, let me ask you about the incoming Biden administration. <laughs> I mean, under President Obama and Joe Biden as vice president, um, though their jargon, their language was extremely different when it came to immigrants, when it came to deportations, they deported more immigrants than I think most presidents combined <clears throat> in the past, millions and millions and millions of people coming into this country. What do you expect of the incoming Biden-Harris administration? Uh, we have to remember that Biden and Trump are two sides of the same coin, which is U.S. imperialism and intervention, especially in places like in Central America. Uh, while uh, personally I was excited that Trump um, lost, obviously, the Biden administration, uh, we have to be careful. Um, as you mentioned, Obama, the Obama administration, Obama is known as the deporter-in-chief, right, as a result of his reputation within uh, the migrant community. Um, um, but one of the things that a lot of people uh, don't um, aren't aware of is that during the Obama administration, in order to combat uh, migration coming from Central America, specifically unaccompanied minors, uh, Biden and Obama designed the Alliance for Prosperity, which was initially a $1 billion um, uh, initiative in order to promote um, security, good governance, and uh, international investment to Central America in order to try to curb migration. Uh, Biden spearheaded that uh, beginning in 2015. Uh, and so, and, and, and what's interesting is once Trump took over, um, it was one of the few Obama era initiatives that he actually didn't get rid of. Uh, so it was a project. So again, this, this is a U.S. interventionist policy. Um, this is where we have the, 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 um, the introduction of Central America being portrayed as the Northern Triangle, which is an extremely militaristic term. Uh, so I always encourage folks not to use that concept of the Northern Triangle, because again, it, it's within this kind of U.S. interventionist logic that Central America needs saving uh, from the U.S. Uh, so under the under the Alliance for Prosperity, uh, we've seen increased militarization in Central America, aiding very corrupt uh, Central American presidents. Um, uh, the Honduran president right now, Juan Orlando, um, his brother was uh, convicted of, of, of uh, criminal activity with narco traffickers here in the U.S. He's also been implicated in that. Uh, former President Jimmy Morales, who was being investigated by for corruption by a U.N. watchdog group called CSIG, um, basically ended CSIG. He hicked them out. And he actually used uh, military vehicles donated by the U.S. Department of Defense to intimidate human rights activists um, and other people who were investigating him for corruption. Uh, so I think with Biden, we expect more of the same in terms of U.S. foreign policy in Central America. And finally— um, And unfortunately— Go ahead, Giovanni. Yeah, and when we think about um, the other, uh, so with Biden, you know, he's going to promote neoliberal policies um, through international investment, which is basically more mega projects and sweat uh, sweatshops. Um, looking at the case of uh, Palo Viejo, which I investigate, when we think about these mega projects, we always have to ask development for who. Um, in Cozal, where I do my work, only 37 percent of the population has access to electricity. Um, uh, uh, this Palo Viejo hydroelectric plant generates about 30 to 40 million dollars in profits they only leave less than three hundred thousand uh, dollars to the municipality uh, which is less than a percent um, so again when we think about these mega projects which the biden administration will definitely promote we always have to ask development for who who does it benefit it doesn't benefit indigenous communities um, and it only benefits corporations giovanni bats i want to thank you for being with us president's postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. His upcoming book, tentatively titled The Fourth Invasion, Decolonial Histories, Mega Projects, and Ishilmaya Resistance in Guatemala. That does it for our show. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Libby Rainey, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tadesena, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Trina Nadura, Sam Alkoff, Tamari A Studio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Massoud, and Adriana Contreras, our general manager is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Marion Barnard, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Hugh Grant, Dennis Moynihan, David Brood, and Dennis McCormick. Stay safe, wear a mask. I'm Amy Goodman.